1936, Germany. Jesse Owens. One of the greatest stories I've ever read. I really admire this courageous man running before Hitler, who was in the stand that day. Jesse Owens grew up in Alabama. Ended up in Cleveland. His parents moved there. And um, his real name was James Cleveland. It was a little boy. The teacher asked him one day, what's your name? And he just used J.C. They told the teacher J.C. And she thought that he said Jesse. And so he went by that name for the rest of his life. That man stood before Hitler. Hitler had his runners there that day. He won four gold medals. 1936. In a 100 meter. 200 meter, the 4 by 100 relay, and the long jump. What a man. Courageous. To me, he was a hero. I really love, of all the Olympics I've ever watched, and all of the stories, and there have been many, this is one of the greatest stories that you'll ever see. I have a few pictures I want to put up here. Uh, Simon Kruger, the 30 kilometer, 18 mile, ski a -thon. Interesting, I don't know if you noticed that. I, I don't know how many uh, skiers there were, maybe 40, 50 of them. 18 miles, and uh, when they got started, he fell. And that's a picture of him, just this last week. But he didn't give up. You remember last week, Pastor Bruce talked about failing. But he never gave up. This man got up. He lost one of his poles. He took off. And in that 18 miles, he passed all of the other skiers and was coming across the finish line. He looked back. They showed a picture of him looking back. And you could hardly see the people that was following him trying to win that race. And I thought, wow, what courage. What character that takes to fall and to continue on and to win the race. How about Michaela Schifrin? She um, won the woman's giant slalom. The gold medal this past, um, past week. Then, of course, that 17-year-old boy, I think, from Colorado, California. I don't know where he was from. Snowboard, Red Garrard. Uh, what a guy he was, huh? Very first gold that we won. So we talk about the, the gold medals, and we talk about winning, and talking about um, playing in the game. And um, these people, upon the biggest stage that they'll ever be upon, it's a world stage. It's interesting to watch them. Now, you and I probably will never be on a stage like what they're on. And uh, there's some that win the gold medal, the silver, and the bronze. But there are all of the athletes that participate. You see, John Wooden, the um, basketball coach at UCL for so many years, he came up with a statement about winning and success. He says they're not the same. Many of these people win a gold medal, some of them a silver, the bronze. But he said they can all be successful, even though they did not win that medal. And this is how he defined success. This is his own definition. He said it's peace of mind attained only through self-satisfaction in knowing you made the effort to do the best of which you are capable. If you do that, then you are successful. And so I want to kind of follow along with the Olympic team that we have. Pastor Bruce is at uh, some uh, conferences this week. Uh, another one next week, uh, the starting of the week. And um, I got a little message from him this morning. He says he's getting relaxed. Uh, he'd been working pretty hard since he got back here in October. Started getting back into that uh, uh, that time zone and everything of um, uh, the counseling and different things and preaching and sometimes you just need to get away and so he got away and uh, he's probably watching all of you right now somewhere on the cameras I'm sure they're probably laughing at everything going on somebody scratching their head or whatever it might be and and so so but we're going to keep up with that theme the apostle Paul uses the analogy of sports many many times in the scripture he talks about running the race he talks about beating the air or shadow boxing. He talks about wrestling, pinning down, holding down those temptations that we have. 
He talks about um, finishing the course. I fought a good fight. Many, many things he talks about when it comes to being courageous and from the sports field. There's a lot of courageous individuals in the Bible. Most of them that we know are famous. We hear of people like Noah and Abraham, and Isaac, David, Peter, the Apostle Paul. But there's a lot of courageous people in the Bible that were not the big shots, not the big guys, not on the big stage. They were people that were just ordinary people. And so my message today, I want to challenge us with that thought. Most of us will never be on the big stage, but all of us are very important when it comes to God's kingdom. And I want to challenge you and encourage you with that today. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Bruce talked about Ben and I, who chased the lion into the den on a snowy day. So today I want to introduce you to a guy by the name of Shemgar. He's found in the book of Judges. I want to read the scripture to you. Judges chapter 3, verse number 31. Listen to it carefully. After Ehud, after him was Shamgar, the son of Anna, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad. And he also saved Israel. So the picture that you have is a man that took an ox goad, killed 600 Phil Philistines, and he saved Israel. There's only one verse in the Bible given to him. Judges chapter 3, verse number 31. There's one more verse in the Bible that talks about the time in which he lived in. One verse. 26 words are given to this man, Shemgar. Let me ask you a question today. If God would give you one verse in the Bible about your life, 26 words, you opened up the Bible, and there you were. What do you think God would write about you? Shamgar, 26 words. We don't know a lot about him. We don't know much about him as we do David or the other great giants. But here was a man, and don't miss this. Here was a man, one verse, 26 words, that saved Israel. And we're going to look at his life for a little bit today. The book of Judges. It's quite a book. I'd like to give you a little background of Israel before we come into the book of Judges. Moses had died. He was never able to take the children of Israel into the promised land. So Joshua was chosen to do that. And Joshua did a great job in leading the Israelites. Well over a million people across the Jordan River into the Canaan land. It's a land filled with milk and honey. It was a prosperous land. And Joshua leads them across. And, and, and they fight many, many battles in the promised land. God fought those battles for them. And they lived for God. And they did not have false idols. But they trusted God. They lived for God. They worshiped God. But one day, Joshua dies. And now they do not have a leader. As long as they had Joshua, everything was fine. They had the elders that held them together for a while. But it wasn't long until they became contaminated from the culture and the philosophy of the Canaanites. Much like what we see in America today, we become contaminated with the culture and the philosophy. And that happened with the Israelites. And they begin to serve other gods. And every time they begin to serve other gods, their life began to dwindle away. They no longer had that spiritual life. They had all kinds of situations, and it was painful. And the first thing you do when you're living in pain, you cry out to God. And they did that. You know, God's a wonderful God. When you cry out to God, I guarantee you, he is always there just for you. But that's what they did. They did not have kings in that day. And so God gave them judges. The book of Judges is about judges. There are 12 of them in the book of Judges. One of them is a woman by the name of Deborah. The one that was just before Shamgar was called Ehud. 
And so that's where the story unfolds. They were living in sin. They had been contaminated by the Canaanites. Life is terrible. And they cry out to God. And God gives them a judge. And then they straighten up. And then they go back into living in sin again. God gives them another judge. And then they straighten up. I taught this, uh, at the book of Judges at a high school, a Christian high school a couple of years ago. And I went all through the semester. And at the end of the semester, one of the seniors said to me, he said, why didn't God just kill them? And I said, you know, that's a good idea. Just get rid of them. And then I said to him, but why doesn't God just kill us? Because we do the same things oftentimes. Yeah, we do. You see, we, we, we get in touch with God. We live for God. And the first thing you know, uh, some of the philosophy of the world gets into our life and the culture. And then we begin to dwindle away from him. And then we cry out to him and we come back to him. And so I said to the student, why doesn't God just kill us? And he didn't think that was a very good idea. But I want you to know what the times were like in the day of Shamgar. Chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. Listen to it carefully. In the days of Shamgar, this was Deborah's song. In the day of Shamgar, son of Anna, in the days of Jael, listen to this. The highways were abandoned. The travelers kept to the byways. The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as mother of Israel. They were hiding. This was a man, a brave man, that lived in times much like what we live in today. A scary time. I'm almost afraid to go to the shopping center anymore. Afraid that you might be mugged. You see, the Philistines were thugs, robbers, thieves. Beat them up. They could no longer walk down the highways. They had to hide through the byways. The villages were empty. They probably had taken their swords and their spears away from them. Here was a brave man, Shamgar, that lived in a scary time. And I'm to stand here today to say that we live in a scary time. And we need to be courageous and we need to be brave. And here was a man that was Shamgar, is his name. 25 verses, 25 words in one verse. A very, very courageous man. He was an unlikely hero who used an unlikely weapon to win an unlikely victory. You may be saying to me today, I don't have anything to offer. You may be comparing yourself to other people. And you say, I don't have a big stage. I don't have a big stage to stand on. You see, we've become so acclimated to big. The big politician. The big movie star. The big athlete. The big evangelist. The big stage. That we begin to think we have nothing to offer for the cause of Christ. And the fact of it is, God probably uses people just like us more than he does those people. You may say, I don't have the big stage. Well, we're going to look at that today. I want you to nip that in the bud right now. You are important in the kingdom of God. You know, I was thinking about when I was writing a book. One of the things that ever kept me from doing that, and I wanted to do that for 20-some years. And finally, I, th I thought, you know, the reason I'm not writing the book is because I don't have a stage in order to sell the book. But I begin to realize that what I have to say is just as important what anybody else has to say. So I finally sit down, and whether I have a big stage or not, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. So I sit down to write the book. I didn't know how to write a book. I don't know if I know how to write a book today. But I want to encourage us today that you may be the person sitting here today that will save somebody else's life from destruction. Don't just think big. In a few minutes, I'm going to show you a video that I think that you'll really like about it's a small things that changes the world. 
So now that we have the history of Israel at that time, I want to go look at Shamgar. The three success secrets of Shamgar. You've got them there in your bulletin. Number one, they're very simple. Start where you are. Start where you are. There he is. Shamgar. He was a farmer. He had oxen. He had a, an ox goat. A prod, a cattle prod. That's where he's at. He is in the field. He had not been trained in the military. He did not have the sword. He did not have the knives and things that he would have to fight. He didn't have a shield. He started where he was. Can you imagine what that picture must have been like? There wasn't anybody traveling down the highways. Everybody was hiding because it was a scary time. People were being mugged. They were being threatened. Probably people dying. They had no protection. And he looks off across the field, and here come 600 Philistines. And they're coming. And he knows what this is about. But there he is with the ox goat. And the Bible says that he killed 600 of these people with the ox goat. Now, I'm sure we'll probably try to debate as to whether it was 600 at one time or if he killed one 600 times. But we'll talk about that just a little bit. So let me give you the next point. It takes courage to start where you are. It takes courage. I'm sure he was hopeless. He was helpless. And he could have said, I am a nobody. I have absolutely nothing to offer. But Shamgar rose to the occasion. Where did he start? Out in the field. With the oxen. The Philistines are coming. 600 of them. Well, it takes a lot of commitment to stand there, doesn't it? Yes, it does. But here was a man that was willing to stand up in a scary time. Much like it is in America today. To stand up and to do what needs to be done. It takes not only courage, it takes commitment to start where you are. It takes a commitment to God. You may say there was one man standing in the field. How could he do that? How could he kill 600 people? I would say to you today, there was more than one man standing in the field. I think there were probably two. I think God was standing in the field with him. Do you agree with that? I think God was there, and God wiped them out. 600 of them. You say, can God do that? God can do anything God wants to do. And I believe that's exactly what he did. Shamgar. And God. When you have God on your side... You're the majority when he's at your side. And that's exactly what we see with this man. No excuses for not starting where we are. There's no excuses. But I'm just a nobody. There are no excuses for us not starting where we are. So my question today is, where is your starting point? Start where you are. Some of you may be here today and you need to start thinking about your relationship with God. You may have been coming to church here for a number of months, maybe a couple of years, and you've never developed a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would like to encourage you to do that today if that should be you. The most important decision any one of us here will ever make is my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing any more important than that. And maybe you've been sitting and listening and wondering and what's this all about, this Christianity, faith? What's it all about? What do you mean put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? What do you mean salvation? What do you mean forgiveness of sin? What do you mean heaven? It's the most important thing that any of us 
we'll ever make a decision on. It's a starting point. A relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, there may be some of you here today, you may say, well, you know, I was baptized when I was young, or I, I do a lot of work. Doesn't that count for going to heaven? Forgiveness of sin. I'm a good person. I, I'm religious. But it's not about those things. It's about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about receiving him into your life. Believing that what he's done upon the cross is what took care of the sin problem. And we need to receive him. And so that may be the starting point of some of you here today. For some of you, it may be another area, your starting point, that you need to start moving forward in a courageous way. Maybe it's getting baptized. Maybe it's starting to serve in some way. There could be so many starting points with all of our lives. But Shamgar started where he was. And that's not always easy because sometimes we don't think we can do it. I can remember back in probably 1966 or 67, and my wife and I were attending the Gideon Baptist Church located over at um, Pawnee in the interstate. And I'd just gotten back into church. And I'd been going maybe for a year. And I grew up in the church, but I didn't know beans about the Bible. And, uh, you know, doesn't say much about the church I went to, but, I, you know, I, uh, my dad knew a lot, so I thought, well, I know a lot. And so, one Sunday, um, the pastor asked me to teach the youth department. And I thought, well, you know, yeah, I can do that. And so, it was an hour class, and I prepared for that Sunday, and Shirley came in with me. And, and so, after about... Um, uh, probably 10 minutes I had a little music and I started teaching and about five minutes later I ran out of material. <laughs> I didn't have anything to teach and so there I am standing there a bunch of teenagers sitting out there and man they were making fun of me and, and you know I thought oh man pastor's son was in there and he knew all the Bible verses and he's throwing them at me and I wanted to slap him and everything <laughs> and uh, I thought you know you can't do this to me and I had the most embarrassing thing. And my poor wife, she was over there. She had her head down her hands. And, oh, I married that, that idiot. But there I was. And so I thought, well, I can either quit or I'm going to stay with this. And so I told Shirley, I said, I'm going to go home and study. And next week, I'll have five hours of material right in front of me. And I did. I had five hours. Boy, I wasn't going to go through that again. But that challenged me. That was a starting point. That challenged me to uh, join a, um, a uh, correspondence course from Moody Bible in, in uh, Chicago. And so I took a, back then, now you can go on the Internet and do that. This is before the Internet. And so I took this um, Bible course. It was on the book of Genesis. And I enjoyed reading. I enjoyed studying. And one, but probably a year and a half later, I surrendered to go into the ministry. And uh, went to Bible college. And went out, started a couple churches. And, and, uh, but the starting point was standing in front of a bunch of teenagers that just made a fool out of me. But I wasn't going to let that destroy me. The starting point. You have to have a starting point. I, mean, I don't care how old you are. Maybe some of you here getting up into age and you say, well, I'm all through. I've done that. I, God's through. No, no, no. God's never through with you. There's another starting point. Doing something. Teaching a class. Whatever it may be. Making some kind of a commitment. Starting point. Shamgar, start where you're at. The second point is this. Use what you have. Use what you have. Shamgar had an ox goad. That's all he had. Small weapons matter in the kingdom of God. It was a pole about seven feet long. One end it was sharpened. On the other end was a little shovel. That's all he had. Small weapons matter in the kingdom of God. The second thing is this. God's weapons are more powerful than human weapons. I love this scripture in 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verse number 4. It says, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning 
and destroy false argument. God's weapons are strong. Shamgar and God, that's all that was needed to kill 600 Phil Philistines and to save Israel. Discover your weapon. Thirdly, discover your weapon. What is it? You may say, well, I can't teach. I can't get up and sing like the worship team. Didn't they do a good job today? They always do. I can't do that. I just can't do that. But what do you have? What do you have to use? You have something. What is it that you might have? And we're not talking big things. We're not talking getting behind the microphone or whatever it may be. In the lights. We're not talking those things. What is it that we have? Maybe small. But it's valuable in the hands of God. Let me give you some suggestions what you might have. You have a smile. Use it. Use what you have. You have a handshake. Use it. Do you have a word of encouragement? Then use it. Well, that's not very big. I mean, I want to be up on the big stage. No, that is the big stage. It's the small things that matter in God's kingdom. How about a broken heart? Many of you right here today, you've had a broken heart. Use it for the glory of God. It doesn't have to be used up here. It may be used in an apartment somewhere where somebody's about ready to commit suicide. It's not the big things that changes the world. It's the small things that changes the world. What is it that you have? A keen mind? Maybe a sin of the past that you've been able to overcome and and, and you can use that to help people to overcome sin. Maybe you have a hurt, a tragedy. Little can become much when placed in the hands of God. Use what you have. Watch this video. This was an admiral. Some of you probably have seen it. 19 minutes. So I only got a couple of minutes of this. Listen to it. Turn it up, with you? 10 lessons I learned from basic SEAL training that hopefully will be of value to you as you move forward in life. Every morning in SEAL training, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up in my barracks room, and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning, we were required to make our bed to perfection. It seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough, battle-hardened SEALs. But the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made. <laughs> that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. There you go. Right out of the Bible, isn't it? Make your bed. But what he's trying to say is that little things matter. Little things make a difference. It's not on the big stage. It's the little things that make a difference. Start where you are. Use what you have. The third point, do what you can. Do what you can. No one else was doing it. Shamgar stepped up to the plate to do what he could. We can't just sit back and not do anything. Do what you can. That's all God would ask. James chapter 1 verse 22. But be you doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving our own selves. 
So the three little points I have there for us is this. Not just study, but doers. Not just hearers, but doers. Not just talkers, but doers. Doers. Have to do. Do what you can. We may ponder the Word of God. We may dissect it, digest it, discuss it, analyze it. But in the final analysis, we are to do the Word of God. The devil will say unto you, you can't do it. He talks to us all the time to try to defeat us. You can't start where you are. You can't use what you have. You can't do what you can. But God says you can. For I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Do what you can. A little girl. 1970. Shirley and I, uh, our family went to McPherson, Kansas. We started a church from scratch. We had uh, nine people the first Sunday, and five of them was my family. And uh, after being there four years, uh, God called us out to the Washington, D.C. area, went out there and started work. We had a uh, man and woman that started coming to our church. He was a race driver. A real rough guy. Not that race drivers are rough guys, but this one was. <laughs> I thought I better put that in <laughs> for Johnny. <laughs> but this one was. And, uh, and so he came to church a couple times. And, and uh, he came in and sat down one Sunday morning in a pew uh, visiting. And one of our church families uh, walked in and walked up to him and said, We sit in this pew. Would you mind finding another one? And he stood up and got his wife and little girl and he looked at the, uh, the, the guy from our church that was a deacon. And he said, if that's your blankety blank chair, go ahead and sit down. I'm out of here. I thought, well, how in the world am I going to save this guy? <laughs> what do I need to do? So I started visiting with him and I like automobile racing and gone to him for years. And so we really had a connection and we tried to lead him to Christ. and He'd always reject it. And finally, one day I got a, a call from the hospital. They said he just had a heart attack and he wanted to talk to me. So I went up to the hospital and I sat down on the side of his bed. And, and I said, you know, uh, you've been putting this off. Do you think it's time now to receive Christ as your personal Savior? He said, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think I'm ready for this. So he got saved. His wife got saved. This little girl, probably about maybe 10, 11, 12 years old. I'm not sure how old she was, got saved. And they came to church every Sunday. And I got to baptize him. And, and uh, he weighed about almost 300 pounds. And so... I got him out, okay, but it, it was fun. But um, when we um, decided to go to Maryland, uh, they had a little going away party for us. And um, this little girl's grandmother had just passed away about a month before. And so she came up with this little vase. It was wrapped in newspaper and said, I want to give this to you. And she had tears in her eyes. And so I opened it up and I looked at it and she said um, there were some flowers in there at my grandmother's funeral. And so um, I want to give it to you. So I looked at her mom and I said, no, nah, come on, I, I can't take this. This belongs to her. Remember her grandmother. She said, no, no, she wants you to have that. And so she gave it to me and I've kept it all these years. And I got thinking that I was going to preach today. But here was a little girl that uh, started where she was, maybe 11, 12 years old. She used what she had, a little vase, and she did what she could. And she encouraged me. And I may be in the ministry today because some little girl started where she was, used what she had, and did what she could. It's been up my attic for all these years, 45 some years. I don't look at it all the time. But almost every year, I think about this little vase. You see, maybe she saved my ministry. Shamgar saved Israel. I didn't save Israel. But there might be somebody that I might save. There might be somebody that I could save. Maybe just somebody here 
in this building today, you, what you have, where you're at, you could save somebody from destruction. I think that's what I get from Shamgar's life. Start where he was, used what he had, and did what he could. I want to challenge us today. I want to challenge each and every one of us. Justin's going to come in just a moment. But as we give an invitation today, if you are here and you've never ever trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I would challenge you, encourage you that today of all days, you're finally going to start. And you're going to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. In just a few minutes, I'm going to be right down front here. So everybody's out of here. And if you've been thinking about the fact that you need Jesus Christ, because we live in scary times, that this would be the day that you would say, God, I want you to forgive me. I want to receive you as my Lord and Savior. I want to have faith in you. And maybe you've been thinking about the big stage. Get it out of your mind. It's not about the big stage. There are over 7 billion people in the world. All of the big stages in America only touch a few of those people. You don't see the big stage in Afghanistan. You don't see it in China. You don't see it in most places in the world. We only see it in America and we think that's where it's all happening. It's not on a big stage. It's the little things that changes the world. Start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. God depends upon it. We are the ones I'm glad for the big stage. I'm glad for all those people that preach the gospel that goes out. But I have come to the conclusion that it's the little things that make a difference. Maybe you need to bring whatever it is that you have and say, God, I'm going to start today. I want you to use it. And I'll do what I can. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity of preaching the gospel today. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be able to encourage and to challenge. Thank you, Father, for people that come to church on Sunday and, and they want to be challenged. They want to be encouraged. They want to be used. Father, whatever it is that's in their hand, the, the little thing, Father, encourage them today. Start today. Father, bless this time. May the Holy Spirit of God just speak to us in a marvelous way. Power. God, we would know the presence of God through the Spirit of God. God, I know that you speak to us through the Spirit. I know, Father, that you do a business within our lives that we, we know nothing about, but it's there. We sense it. Sometimes we're afraid. God, I just pray that all that fear be removed today. This will be the day that we start. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please stand if you would.